Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Uh, this time it's about how to make a ranged focus list with a Demon Legions army book. Um, I have been looking at the Demon Legions army book for a while now and I'm just going through it, going through the different choices and um, I also did a video on, on oh, a couple of videos on it now. Um, and most Demon Legion's lists you see are currently quite combat focused, but I was wondering if it's still possible to make uh, a shooting variant uh, that used to be quite popular also um, years and years ago. Uh, so, yeah, the biggest focus of, of Demons is um, which characters that you take, and that basically um, also decides the rest of your list. So it is possible to take double harbingers, harbingers, and then, um, well, go with that, or you can get any of the any of the greater demons. For the, yeah, my consideration for this um, for this ranged build is going to be that uh, ideally I want a wizard master on thaumaturgy. Um, so basically any. Create a demon that uh, can have access to thaumaturgy and can become a wizard master is a potential candidate there. Um, and I was looking at the, the Sentinel of Nakuya um, because he's basically the wizard master on thaumaturgy to go because he gets some bonuses. I was also looking at the manifestation, let me see where it is, the horns of hubris here. Manifestation of Pride, Horns of Hubris, the model, and each rank of our model in the unit if you take it guiding, gains Vanguard 6 inches. And this Vanguard 6 inches is actually quite important because that allows you to um, Vanguard 6 inches with your Imps. And your Imps, they have the Energy Bolts on 4+, plus, um, range 24 inches, shots 1, strength 5, AP 0, uh, with Folly Fire. Oh, that's actually interesting. <laughs> Um, but that means that if you are already vanguarded up, then you can uh, shoot at least on a 5+, plus instead of having to move and shoot at a 6+. plus. Uh, so that makes a big difference in your first turn shooting. Um, but even then, if you have like uh, a unit of 18 imps or so, and you deploy them 9 wide, which is going to be incredibly wide, um, if you vanguard them up six inches, you do get 18 shots. They're going to hit at five plus, so you get six strength five. A B zero hit. Um, yeah, that can be good. It, it's mostly probably good to support. So whether it's valuable or not to get these horns of hubris for the six inch vanguard is uh, is a bit of a question. It also depends on on how the board space uh, plays out. I mean, the imps they got forty fire, so. If you have any standard uh, size model in front of them, they don't really care. But other models uh, might care a bit more. Uh, so this is one of your assets in terms of shooting the imps. Um, another asset would be the... Where are they? The Hope Harvester. It's a engine with an Aether battery. So that's a volley gun with range 18 inches. Uh, it shoots on a 3+, plus. if it moved it becomes a 4+, plus. if it's further than 9 inches away it becomes a 5+. plus. Uh, if you roll a 6 on your amount of shots then you are hitting at a 6+. plus. So Normally with, with volley guns if you look at them they, they look like they hit quite decently but if you factor in all the, uh, the different facts <laughs> then they don't anymore because even pivoting for this machine um, just makes a big difference. Uh, you can discard fail tokens, um, and then if you discard one fail token, you get three extra shots. Uh, if you're already hitting on a 5+, plus, basically that's one fail token trades up for one strength 4 AP1 hit. Um, it can be interesting, uh, especially against uh, a unit that you really want to kill. Um, but I don't really know if it's really worth it. I think the manifestations here are not that interesting. Segmented shell gives you an armor save. That's a little bit... Oh no, that, that uh, makes it that multiple wounds uh, only deal half of the wounds. Which is kind of interesting. Um, but it's only interesting if your hope officer is really a threat to your opponent. The sorceress antennae 
Uh, they do some channel stuff, I believe. Um, maybe that would be an interesting one because it's only 30 points and to give you channel one would be nice. Aura of this pair gives minus two on the charge range of opponents, which is really nice actually for the short range that you have. Um, so that might be still an okay one. Mark of the Eternal Champion gives you the hereditary spell and becomes a wizard a apprentice. You're going to have magic elsewhere. And chilling your own lowers the agility of uh, models in base contact by two. But <laughs> while well, you have agility one, you can use it as a support piece to charge into something. Because um, it still has resilience five, it still has some armor, some Aegis, uh, and a couple of attacks. So it's not too bad in combat even. Um, but then this would require a build that you really um build on on getting this thing in combat with something that has a decent agility but not always high enough uh the last piece in the list that has shooting is the where are they the eidolons so eidolons they used to be the flamers of scenes i believe um as you can see they have dark fire on a three plus what does dark fire do dark fire gives you two shots uh, two shots at strength 4, I believe. It's over here. Dark fire. Two shots, strength 4, AP 0. But armor save rolls of 1, 2, 3, and 4 are always considered failed. Um, so the best armor save you can have against these shots is uh, 5 up armor save. So against rank and file units, this is not that good. Um, and this. Ranked 5 AP 0 has a little bit of the same issue that it's quite good against monsters, uh, quite good against stuff with um, a decent resilience but no armor. Um, and these guys are really good against things with a lot of armor but <laughs> not with just a little bit of armor. So we still face the issue of having to deal with stuff that, well, just has a little bit of armor uh, but not too much. Uh, so basically, rank and file troops, um, but that's gonna that's gonna be quite okay to deal with uh, through magic and just other choices in the arm. Um, yeah, so now I was looking at uh, making a list with the Sentinel of Nukuya, um, because the Sentinel of Nukuya, where I see, the first time I saw this entry, I was really really conflicted internally. <laughs> so this is the Sentinel of Nukuya. Um, he gets an Aegis against special attacks, that's not that important. Uh, the Omniscience, uh, so in the owner's magic phase, if you didn't march or move or declare a charge, um, the cost of converting veil tokens into magic dice is decreased to 2 to 1 during this player turn. So that is incredible in the sense that you don't really need a lot of channel in your list anymore. Uh, so you have a Wizard Master, uh, you channel two extra because you're playing demons and then you have to channel on the, the card um, and yeah if you channel two for one you basically don't need any more channel in your list to get quite a decent amount of uh, of dice um, but I, I think you're still limited to getting four extra dice so you will get like four extra dice every single turn you will get an incredible magic phase uh, but the question is whether that not always applies already with demons uh, because you still have the uh, immortal denizens special rule so casting rolls uh, with one or two dice gain a plus one casting modifier um, so with a single magic dice a roll of a one or a two is always a fail casting attempt uh, but anyway um, you're gonna mostly be casting on two dice probably, uh, except for your hereditary that's on a four plus. You get a plus one to cast if you cast with one dice, so it's basically on a three plus uh, on any model that that casts it. So if we go to the Sentinel of Nukuya, it is an interesting model um, in the sense that it can be a Tomaturgy Wizard Master, and you get a lot of of magic dice. Uh, so he really takes it to the next level with the magic. Uh, my question is whether it's not better to just take any other wizard master because you're a wizard master anyway. Um, so you get a plus one from that. You get a plus one from the fact that if you cast with two dice or one dice, you get this. <laughs> um, so you will be casting at a plus two a lot of times anyway. Uh, so it's only the magic dice that this guy uh, brings. 
And this guy doesn't bring that much else for the list, I, I fear. So he has advanced 2 and March 4. This is a little bit of a distraction because you yeah, have to either choose Subtraction Spirit or Dark Pulpit. You must choose one of these. If you take the Dark Pulpit, um, then the Dark Pulpit here, then you go to advanced 5, March 10, so then you don't have any trouble at all anymore. And the Subtraction Spirit, you gain fly 6 inch, 18 inches. So probably you will be flying around for 6 inches. You get plus 1 resilience, so you go to resilience 6, you get plus 1 health points for HP 6. And you're gonna be gigantic. So basically this is the old uh, flying model for the uh, Lord of Change. Um, I would go for the Dark Pulpit, I think, in order to just better protect my, uh, my model. Um, because I do face some cannons sometimes, and this guy does not like cannons, especially when you take uh, gigantic and wings. Uh, because with clipped wings, any cannon shot, any decent cannon shot, is going to do at least three health point wounds. Uh, you have a four up Aegis, but yeah, still, it's it's really scary, um, or at least to me. So in conclusion, I think this guy uh, doesn't really bring anything to the list that other choices don't do, but. I'm also a bit of an offensive player in the sense that I play quite offensively. Um, and I wonder that, um, well, probably if you play quite defensively, this uh, this is a choice for you, potentially. Um, I haven't given it a lot of thought if demons have a lot of other gigantic choices that you can hide behind. But I think the only one is the Hope Harvester that you can make gigantic. Um, so if you're going to go for that, uh, for the, what's its name, for the Sentinel of Nakuya, uh, then I would definitely take a gigantic Hope Harvester. So if you face some cannons, you can just uh, hide behind your Hope Harvester. So that's that. Um, uh, yeah. I'm gonna go to the next choice that I thought was interesting. I'll just go for this one. So here we have the Omen of Savar. Um, well, basically it's the Omen of Savar Harbinger, Harbinger of uh, Father Chaos build. Uh, so the reason here is that he has the Dominion of Pride. The Dominion of Pride allows you to get the Horns of Hubris, and the Horns of Hubris give you Vanguard six inches for um, you guy and the uh, unit that he is in if you take them guiding um, so I took some um, some stuff here so I have an omen of Savar. he's a wizard master on Tamaturgy so we do get that um, he has brimstone secretions because a lot of um, models that want to fight him in combat have um, um, divine attacks or at least it's quite common for characters to be built with uh, blessed inscriptions or some other form of uh, getting to divine attacks. Dexter's Tentacles make sure that he does have the Agility 7 that he might need to strike first. And basically that's it. <laughs> I'm not spending too much points on a model that is already 830 points. And is going to be mostly just casting my magic. Um, so if he did something more than just to cast my magic I would uh, invest a bit more in him. But we can see that between the Sentinel of Nakuya and the Omen of Savar, you lose another like 150 points. But the Omen does have a lot of potential in jewels, so it does um, help against single models. And he has a March 18, so he can go wherever he wants uh, to zone out uh, cowboys, basically. Um, yeah, with that we have a Harbinger of Father Chaos, uh, he also has the Guiding Horns of Hubris, so as you can expect in core we have two units of Imps, they're both going to get Vanguard 6 inches. Um, this is quite heavy in magic because I have a Wizard of Master, Wizard Adept, and two Wizard Apprentices in the Imps. The Apprentices have to take their Hereditary spell by the way. Um, in order to deal a little bit better with rank and file I have 15 Succubi. Um, I don't know if this is enough. I have little idea of how much the magic is going to do. Uh, four Brazen Beasts to zone my opponent mostly and make him not come towards me. Uh, then 10 Eidolons, 8 
Eidolons, which is the maximum amount of Eidolons you can put in the list, because I think these guys are really, really good against a lot of scary stuff that's, uh, that the enemy is going to be able to field. They both have Aura of Despair to make it more difficult for your opponent to charge you whilst still being in um, range. We have a Blazing Glory with Fly and Light Troop so that he can go uh, behind the Imps and the Succubi and charge over them and not be chaffed in the process. Um, we have a Hope Harvester to deal some more range damage and two Trashing Engines to zone my opponent a bit. So this, these Trashing Engines, they basically draw away some, uh, some fire from my opponent. Um, I think this is quite a fun list because it's um, it's ranged offensive um, so you really want to get in there uh, just march up or your vanguard up your imps uh, you shoot uh, first round at the exact 24 inches um, so this is definitely a list that you want to drop with also um, I mean the only guys that might struggle a little bit with where they can shoot are the Eidolons, the eight Eidolons, and the Hope Harvester. Um, if your opponent decides to just go a bit more back to account for your Vanguard, then the points of your Vanguard are also well spent because basically you just get a free magic phase and you can um, you can use your Vanguard. It's a six inch Vanguard, so you can move back three inches, I think, because you don't get light troops automatically. Uh, but I think this this is quite a a neat list. Um, however, I am a little bit fed up with with uh, people playing with the omen because the omen <laughs> just seems to get picked all the time. Um, I don't really know why. Maybe it's to counter the single cowboy uh, characters uh, that pop up all the time. Because d6 plus two attacks at offensive d6 plus five at strength five with uh, lethal strike and multiple wounds too. Yeah, that is quite a lot. Um, there's not a lot of characters that can survive that. So then we go to the build that I think is the most interesting, actually. It's basically nearly the same list, um, except we have a Miser of Sugulak this time. Uh, so we lose out on, on our Wizard Adept, uh, so we lose out on one channel. And that is a bit of a shame, um, but we still have a Tomaturgy Wizard Master. And this is the Miser of Sugalak. I'll just go to him. So basically what this offers you is a piece that is uh, a bit more useful, I think, uh, rather than the Omen or the uh, Sentinel of Nikuya. Because the Miser, um, he has uh, some interesting special rules. He has a Bisal Armor, so that follows the rules for Plate Armor. For each fail token in the Owner's Fail Pool, um, attacks against the wearer suffer minus one armor penetration up to a maximum of minus three. So imagine um, I have plate armor with this rule, so I have a four up armor save. If I leave three veil tokens in my pool, all of the armor penetration attacks are going to lose three AP. Uh, so if you have AP three against my four up um, plate armor, I still keep that. Um, if you have AP0, then, well, I still have my 4-hub um, from my plate armor. So, against attacks with a low amount of AP, it's, it doesn't really work, but the higher in AP you go, the more effective this, uh, this rule is, and especially with a focus on uh, AP3. But you have to keep some veil tokens in your uh, veil token pool, so you might lose a couple here and there. Um, I don't know how badly this affects your magic, but I think if you have the choice between keeping one veil token and four veil tokens, you'll just go for four veil tokens. Um, but if you can choose between two and five, you might just go for two veil tokens and an extra dice. Um, so the critical um, manifestation to take on this guy is his charge tendrils, which allows you to keep up to veil six veil tokens at the end of your veil token. Um, transformation to to uh, to magic dice so that you can um, more freely just uh, play around with this rule uh, because then you don't have to sacrifice any of your any of your veil tokens then we have dominion of greed the model gains plus two defensive skill while its unit is in base contact with an enemy scoring unit 
Um, it has defensive skill 6, uh, which is quite nice. If you're against a scoring unit, you go to defensive skill 8, which is quite incredible, to be honest. Um, you could also take divination somewhere in your list to get scrying. Um, scrying would be good. <laughs> uh, because then you get uh, the uh, hard target and uh, distracting. Um, so that could also be an interesting one. And then the last one is uh, if the model suffers a wound from an attack with multiple wounds, reduce X by half, rounding fractions up. So if you would take four wounds from a cannon, you only take two. If you would take uh, two wounds from a cannon, you only take one. And three becomes two. You have six wounds, you have a resilience of seven. Uh, resilience of seven keeps you safe from anything except for cannons, but then the half off rule uh, helps there. And you can give him Kaleidoscopic Flash for a hard target one, um, which I think is great on this model. Uh, so I think in the end this model is the most vulnerable to just a massed amount of low strength attacks. Um, like, I don't know, Kingdom of Aquitaine Peasant Archers or so, or High Elf uh, Archers. Just stuff that wounds on sixes, uh, that wounds on sixes on anything. Um, because then the difference between, uh, let's say, uh, Hydra and this model is non-existent anymore, because the only difference is basically your resilience of 7 and your abysal armor rule. Um, yeah, so this is, I think it's a cool uh, model in itself. Now, what does this offer in your list? So, if you make this a wizard master... Um, the manifestations I chose, I think, are quite essential on him. The kaleidoscope flash we explored, the hammer hand gives him an extra attack, which is quite needed, I think, with the natural roots. The natural roots give you plus one combat res in combat. So maybe you already see where I'm going, but this model is just a model that you can uh, you deploy. You march it 14 inches up forward, and um, you're just going to see what your opponent's going to do. This is... This is one of the most aggressive choices in Demon Legions, I think. Um, because either your opponent has an answer to it, or he doesn't. Um, if he doesn't, then you can just march up and you have a Wizard Master in the middle of the field uh, that just zones everything, that has range to everything. Your opponent doesn't want to go in it. Um, it is 1000 points, uh, but your opponent first has to deal a little bit damage to it, probably, uh, before he can uh, just chuck something in. If he charges something in and goes into combat with you, that's also fine because then you don't suffer from the range damage that he might have. So depending on different uh, opponents, um, also the timing of when you're just going to uh, stand in the middle of the board is going to be different. Uh, so this is a gigantic beast, which means that it has Thunderstorm, so against infantry it's relatively safe um, with 5 strength, 5 attacks, 6 strength, 5 attacks with hammer hand. The natural root is giving him an extra combat res. Uh, he's going to stick in combat for a long while. Um, he has discipline 9, so even if he loses, he's, uh, there's still quite a chance that he will just not take any wounds. Um, yeah, I don't really know what would be the counter against this model uh, in terms of damage. Uh, like... You could assume that maybe a Feldrak Elder would uh, <coughs> would be able to take this guy. Um, and it might be true if he has a great weapon. Feldrak Elder with great weapon has something like 6 attacks. is going to hit him on 4 plus, so that's 3 hits. going to wound him on 3 plus, so that's going to be 2 wounds. Um, a strength 8, that's 85, so you still have a 6 up armor save. <laughs> um... You still have a 5 of Aegis, so a Feldrak Elder might do one wound to you. <laughs> and then with your five, with your 6 attacks with Amaranth, um, you're going to hit 3 times, you're going to wound 1 time. So you do equal wounds to a Feldrak Elder. Feldrak Elder might not be the good thing to get locked into combat, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then again, you can still with Tormenturgy just cause a breath weapon on yourself and just... Uh, Killed the Feldrock Elder in that way. And you have the mark of the Eternal Champion uh, guys that can just bolt down 
uh, stuff of your opponent. Um, so what else do we have in the list here? I once again have the two times eighteen imps just because I want to see them on the table basically, and and I assume that first turn of the game they're not going to do anything basically, uh, but they have still volley fire. They can still hang in the back line. Uh, it's probably going to take a while for your opponent to go through all the different stuff that you uh, field on the table. We have 15 succubi. Possibly I have to tone down a bit on the imps in this list and make the succubi block a little bit bigger. And then in special we have some brazen beasts to uh, zone out and to counter charge. Um, the Eidolons are back, the Hope Harvester is back, the Blazing Glory is back. I don't think it needs Fly in this list because you already have um, this Miser that you're probably going to send forward, but it, yeah, I'll just see how it works. And I put in two Titan Slayer Chariots to uh, deal with the big guys um, and zone them out. Yeah. I don't know if I have sufficient to just deal with normal <laughs> rank and file, uh, big block stuff like a unit of uh, uh, orcs, a unit of uh, what are they called? The savage orcs, the biggins. I don't know, but maybe the miser can just uh, take them on. <laughs> I'm also not really sure how much the magic is going to do, but the magic, well, the Tomatergy Wizard Master is definitely the way to go with two marks of the Eternal Champion. It's uh, it's probably scary. Um, I have to look into whether I would need maybe just an extra Wizard Adapt, but I think this could be a cool list. It's definitely a cool list with the Miser of Sugarlock. Um, and it basically asks your opponent the question of, yeah, are you going to allow me to cast Tomaturgy on any unit in your line? Or are you going to try to deal with the Miser in some way? Yeah, that's it. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, I'm going to playtest it sometime, but I don't know when yet. Um, just let me know if you have any comments on the list. And uh, yeah, see you the next time.